The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. From the Bible, the book of James, chapter 3, verse 8. Well, there can be no doubt since the communists already control the Czech police and are beginning to go through that, uh, their, this, uh, going, and are beginning to go through this control uh, to, I'm sorry. Speak your speech, I pray you, trippingly on the tongue. William Shakespeare. The big plane crashed into a bridge high up in the mountains. It disintegrated into a, bar, a fire of ball, a ball of fire. There were no, sur <laughs> there were no survivors. Please excuse me. There is glory in a great mistake. Nathalia Crane. Uh. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh. Reminiscing. Just settle back and reminisce a bit. What do you say, huh? With a nostalgic nod toward the Atwater Kent, we now present Same Time, Same Station, a chronicle of broadcasting's first half century. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Tonight, in honor of April Fool's Day, we devote our program to those unintended indiscretions of the airways. Those moments when radio speech was not spoken trippingly on the tongue. Bloopers, goofs, boners, fluffs, slips, boonerisms, flubs, tongue twisters, whatever you call them. They have haunted professional speakers ever since a caveman mispronounced his first grunt. With the advent of radio, the new electronic miracle faithfully carried those tidbits of tongue-tied tripsickery trickery far and wide to the unseen listening and laughing audience. Our program is called, Ladies and Gentlemen, Hubert Heaver. That bit of nostalgic matter certainly qualifies as one of radio's classic boopers. And yet, the legend grows. Did it really ever happen? Yes and no. Reflect upon official protocol, and you will remember that the President of the United States is never introduced by his given name. To set the record straight, let us go to the horse's uh, announcer's mouth. Harry Von Zell introduces us to home savings these days, but long ago, he introduced us to our president. Well, I, I wish I could remember uh, uh, what age Hoover was. It had to be in 1930 that it happened. But it was, it was on the occasion of his birthday. The network was wishing him happy birthday by putting on a full evening... Uh, of all-star uh, entertainment over radio to uh, pay, a, pay tribute to Herbert Hoover and to wish him a happy birthday. And I was the voice on the show. So uh, I had to do about a seven-minute review of Herbert Hoover's life, in which his name was mentioned, uh, oh, no less than 15 or 20 times. And I was extremely nervous through it all because it was at the very beginning of my network career, really. And I was very young, and it meant a great deal to me to have such an assignment, so I was uptight. But I managed to go through the seven minutes without, uh, without error. No frogs in the throat, no, uh, no slips of the tongue, no nothing. And when I came to the last line where I was to wish the president happy birthday by, you know, through this tribute, uh, I relaxed. And when I relaxed, my tongue fell out of my mouth and I came to his name and couldn't say it. That's all there was to it. Actually, it, it, it came out, uh, uh, you know, like a wad of bubble gum. There, there wasn't anything uh, coherent about it at all. But the nearest you could come to it would be, uh, by this tribute, may we express to you our love, our admiration for you, our president, and may we bring you happiness on this, your birthday. 
to our president, Heber Herver. Just as we have cleared the air over Hubert Heaver, we will now present a full hour of radio's classic boopers from the original recordings. To the best of our knowledge, everything you will hear tonight is the original, not a recreation. And so, let's open the show. It's mystery time. Time now for the best in mystery. Tonight on Masters of Mystery, a suspenseful drama entitled Charming Hostess. Hello. Hello, Barbara. Yes. Barbara, this is an old friend of yours, Myra Dorsey. Myra, I think you've made a mistake. No, you're the one who made the mistake. I want to talk to you, Barbara, about a murder. Good evening. This is Don Dowd, your hostess for Mystery Time. all good program. Jerry Moore speaking. Oh, Gary, this is Jimmy. Jimmy Durante, where are you? I'm home taking a bath. But the door on the locked room door? Wait a minute. 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 Give me a cup It's going to be a long... It's going to be a long night tonight. Jimmy Durante, where are you? I'm home taking a bath. But the lock on the bathroom door is broke. Well, suppose it is. What's taking you so long? Junior, did you ever try to take a bat leaning against the door? And so the grand entrances of radio sometimes fell on their respective faces. Before the advent of tape, the entire show was a one-take affair. And sometimes problems could develop when the mics were hot. Lorene Tuttle and Alan Reed remember. One of the funniest breakups I've ever heard in my life uh, occurred on the Jimmy Durante show. It was a thing where the, everybody laughed for about ten minutes. We couldn't get back on the groove. We couldn't get the show back on. But he made a funny little mistake, and it was in a scene with me. I was supposed to... It was always a gimmick. Every week it was a gimmick. I was to come on, we'll say, as a librarian. He'd come in and ask for some books. And then I would explain what things they had in these books. And it would be a, about a long paragraph of great big ten or eight and ten syllable words. And I'd have to get them exactly accurate and straight so that he could then garble them. Although they didn't garble them for him at all. They wrote them straight for him. He did enough to them. And he said something. <laughs> it was not, you know, it was something you wouldn't expect to hear over the air. Well, I've never heard an audience go to pieces so much in my life. It was just, uh, it was so much fun, of course. And uh, the, uh, the booth, you know, when, when something happens out there on the microphones and uh, you look at the booth, they disappear. You know, when, you've, when some, somebody said some terrible thing to you they didn't expect to say, you're looking for help there and there's not a soul there. They're all on the floor and you can't do anything. Um... um Elliot Lewis said something to me one time on the air, and it was so shocking, I could hardly believe it, but I looked in the booth and there was nobody there, so I decided he had said what I thought he said. <laughs> so I had to go on, but luckily I had two pages of narration. It was a thing called, This Is My Story, a very sobby thing. It was a marvelous show. I loved doing it because I could sob all over the place. I was, it was very dramatic. So I just cried for, a whole, for two pages. And it didn't, wasn't difficult at all for me because I just, it, it just got sadder and sadder as the time went on. All the laughing I wanted to do, I put into crying. Well, I was with Fred the night he had the famous uh, eagle, and uh, the eagle got away from his master and flew all over the studio. Uh, and the eagle was nervous. And the studio audience, as he was flying, felt the nervousness. 
And uh, there were frightened cries. The eagle would land on the balcony and people would clear the, the area and run away. You know, jokes like that are going to bring back the Nickelodeon. <laughs> you just keep going. Now, what about our guest? Our guest tonight is the world's foremost authority on eagles. An eagle authority? Well, wherever did you bump into an eagle expert? Well, I heard him on Hobby Lobby last Sunday, so I invited him over. Mr. Allen, meet Captain Charles Knight. Well, good, <laughs> good evening, uh, Captain Knight. Greedy Fred? Well, this is uh, rather a surprise, Captain. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I thought uh, if he raises me one, I'll raise him some. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that you were... <laughs> I didn't know that you were bringing your eagle with you tonight. Oh, yes, my eagle wanted to meet you, Fred. He did? This is Mr. Ramshaw. Well, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Ramshaw. Mr. Ramshaw here is a golden eagle. A golden. He's sort of tarnished a little, isn't he? <laughs> well, is the golden eagle variety ferocious in its natural state? Oh, yes, quite ferocious. I've seen two young golden eagles kill each other in a fight. With the mother bird looking on calmly all the time. The mother looking on. Mm -hmm. Proving that an eagle's best friend is his father. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, uh, what do these 10th Avenue canaries eat beside each other? <laughs> oh, they live on rabbits and grouse and small lambs. It's all very simple, really. You see the eagle flies round looking for game, and when it spies a victim, it swoops down... <laughs> and sinks its talons right into it. And then it's Blitzkrieg, hey? <laughs> well, that's putting it rather mildly, Fred. You see, the eagle's talons have a deadly grip. Yes, I was just looking at those skin stilettos on Mr. Ramshaw there. I'd like to have his claws in my contract, <laughs> Captain. <laughs> He certainly is well-behaved for so savage a fowl. You, uh, how were you ever able to tame him, Captain? Well, fortunately, I got him when he was quite young. Still, the actual training was a very slow and tedious process. And now that Mr. Ramshaw has attained his majority, don't you ever have any trouble uh, handling him? Well, occasionally he does get a bit awkward. He'll take a nip at me or dig into me with his claws. Oh, is that why you wear that thick glove to protect your hand and arm when Mr. Ramshaw goes to town? Yes, Fred. Goes out stepping. <laughs> but when the old boy's in a tantrum, he's apt to pinch me right through the glove. Bite the hands that uh, the hand that needs him. <laughs> hey. Now you said a moment ago, Captain, that you take Ramshaw here around the country with you on all of your lecture tours. Yes, we've traveled from coast to coast, Fred. Well, don't you ever have any trouble checking into hotels with him? What happens when you walk up to the desk with that King Kong Robin on your wrist and say, I'd like to have a double room with a nest? <laughs> I never have any trouble, Fred. Well, where do you quarter him? In your room? Sometimes, but at some hotels, they let me tie him up on the roof. What would happen if he ever escaped? He did escape. Right here in New York. Really? How did it happen? Well, Ramshaw and I live at the Hotel Gotham on 55th Street. And I generally keep him out on the roof. Yes. And one day I went up to the roof, and Ramshaw was gone. Oh, what did you do with Mr. Ramshaw loose? Phone the, the uh, American Airlines? No, oh. I notified the police department. And in no time, every radio, radio car in New York was out looking for him. Well, who finally caught him? Some fly car? No, <laughs> Ramshaw got... <laughs> he got tired. And he came down that evening, and he was found perched in a taxi cab which was going up Madison Avenue. Probably looking for a taxidermist to give Ooh. himself up. <laughs> well, Captain... <laughs> Captain, it's... <laughs> If that eagle knew what was going on here, he'd be out to three of us in no time. It's been nice of you, Captain, to stop off on your lecture tour and bring Mr. Ramshaw in tonight. Now, before you go, I wonder if you could have Mr. Ramshaw give us a sample of his flying prowess. Oh, yes, I think perhaps he might enjoy a short flight around the stage here. Now, stand back, please. You bet. Are you ready, Ramshaw? Go. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Fred. A perfect three-claw landing. I'm surprised that Ramshaw didn't land on Van Steeden's bandstand. Any bird ought to go for the corn in Van Steeden's music. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. 
Good night, Fred. Good night, and thank you a lot, Captain Charles Knight. <laughs> The uh, the eagle just, uh, I didn't know the eagle was cross-eyed. He was flying for that, you see. <laughs> How are you going to get him down, Captain? <laughs> Looks as though he might go with the lease in here after. <laughs> I have a piece of steak, I'll take him down there. All right, you get him down the back way, will you? <laughs> all right, thanks. Well, Mr. Ramshaw is up there, but with his back turned to the program, I guess he's seen all that interests him. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Wynn Murray, I'll keep my eye on the eagle when you just, you can take care of the singing. Miss Wynn Murray is... <laughs> this is apt to be a half-hour program tonight. <laughs> All we need is Mr. Ramshaw to uh, make his own station break, and we'll make it. <laughs> Captain Knight is going to borrow, <laughs> borrow a cow to get Mr. Ram shut down. Miss Wynn Murray will attempt to sing When Love Beckoned on 52nd Street. This was not, this eagle thing that happened was not as it had been planned. And it took a long, long time for, uh, for the program to get back on the air and we never could finish it properly because the time had been used up the trainer was an Englishman and he was frantically and almost in tears trying to call the captain come back here and he had a big leather pouch finally after the longest time with attendants chasing the eagle all over the studio they got him back it was it was a hilarious moment for radio fashion or business or Mr. Allen, I am general sales manager of the Enduro Company. The Enduro Company? That's right. What is that? Well, the Enduro Company manufactures the new Enduro permanent reed for saxophones. Oh, a new reed for saxophones? That's right. Well, what, so, what sort of a reed is it? Well, this is a permanent reed, Mr. Allen. Oh, a permanent. You buy one reed and it lasts your lifetime? Well, it will last indefinitely. Indefinitely. No one has uh, died with an Enduro reed in his hand. So you, <laughs> you can't say. <laughs> What is it made out of that it lasts so long? Well, you see, Mr. Allen, it's made out of a new scientific discovery and developed and called tonalin. Tonalin. And the tone is just as good as the... As the uh... <laughs> well, the... The eagle has finally come to life. I, uh, I think as long as the, uh, Mr. Evans, I want to congratulate you. You were the first one to get a rise out of the eagle since he got up there. And I think as long as the eagle is a bird of prey, that we have just uh, better discontinue the question and start praying from now on. Thanks a lot. I won't even have time to do the question. Thank you. That's uh, the. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to the question tonight. We have a loose eagle in the studio. Uh, Mr. Rockefeller is hardly building a lot of ad lib exits here. And so much time has been taken up with the Captain Knight around there with a pound of hamburger. Tried to get the. Uh, Captain Knight was there with a, uh, a minute steak a minute. Well, now you see what happens. Captain Knight was back there with a minute steak uh, a little while ago, but it was too well done, and the eagle sent it back. Now, he just arrived with the proper steak, and I can assure you that uh, Captain Knight has the eagle or vice versa. We'll... <laughs> now, the, uh, the significance... Meantime, we have no question on the program. But the significance... <laughs> We did have a question, were we going to get out of here alive? But that's been said. <laughs> the significance... <laughs> the significance of the title of the next Mary Mac song, ladies and gentlemen, escapes me, but perhaps you folks can figure it out. The song is Johnson Rag. There goes the Johnson Rag. 
rag. Hoy, hoy. They're going to lay the shag. Ho, ho. And Fred Allen, of course, after that episode, wrote a uh, fantastic uh, letter to John Royal, who was uh, head of uh, operations at NBC at that time. And uh, the letter said uh, it uh, took... uh, He apologized for the fact that he had not expected the eagle to ad lib. And (laughs) it it was a very, very funny and, and... somewhat frightening experience. Yes, before tape recording, it was a one-shot. After Ampex, an actor could retrace his steps, repeat a sentence or phrase correctly, and be assured that the final edited product would be word perfect, if the director remembered to have the tape scissored. Listen to Lloyd Nolan, long before his role as Dr. Chegley. Yes? Mr. Winston's on the phone, Mr. Vickers. Put him on. Hello, Frank. Yes, what? But we've told them we can't do that. We can't force a well to pump more than the normal amount of oil. We can't force a well to point. Hello, Frank? Yes. What? But we've told them that we can't do that. We can't force a well to pump more than the normal amount of... Hello, Frank? Yes. What? But we've told them we can't do that. We can't force a well to pump more than the normal amount of oil. We'll kill it if we do. And while the grown-ups' tongues fluttered aimlessly inside fluff-prone heads, out of the mouth of babes came letter-perfect answers to our every question. But some of those answers just weren't what we expected. What do you want for Christmas? I want a pogo stick. What are you going to do with it? I can jump across the street on it. In one jump? No, in three jumps. Oh, well, that's going to be a long jump, isn't it? Do you have a pet? Yes, I've got three fish and a dog. Does the dog have a pedigree? No, we spaded her. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, sir. What's your name, young fella? Gary Lee Peak. And how old are you, Gary? What animal would you like to be? An octopus. Oh, not a squid. He wants to be a squid, and you want to be a... Why do you want to be an octopus? So I can get out of the children and spike them with my... my testicles. Your your tentacles, you you grab all... Your your tentacles, you grab all the children, and... uh, That's fine, that's fine. Now... What does your father do? Uh, what does your daddy do for a living? Bowling, and he goes fishing. Yeah. And he goes playing baseball. Ah, oh, that, that's fine. <coughs> uh, what, um, what, uh, uh, how'd they meet, do you know? I didn't meet because I was a baby. <laughs> oh, you don't know how they met? Oh, I see. Now, uh, did you, um... <coughs> I think I'll move on. Um, What's your your name? Julia Caroline O'Neill. How old are you, Julia? Five and a half. I understand that you were born in Texas. Yes. How'd you like that? Fine. What's the good about being born in Texas? There are lots of bulls and buffaloes. Oh, and that's good, huh? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Now, what animal would you be? A skunk. Do you know what they do? Yes. They stink something awful, don't they? Yes. You want to do that? Yes. Why do you want to do that? Because I want to make you stink. <laughs> well, after that last interview, I don't feel so good. <laughs> what, uh, what do you, uh, what do you, um, um... Well, we might as well sign this whole thing off. I'm done. Oh, you really, you're such a pretty little girl to want to be a skunk. I can't imagine that. Uh, well, how did your fa- parents meet? Did they ever tell I you? I don't remember. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, didn't the teacher tell me you sing a little song? Yes. Give us a little bit of it. Okay. We are injured warriors, warriors, big chief. In John Warriors, Warriors, ah, 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 ooh, ooh, 
Thank you very much. <laughs> very cute. Well, that's, that takes care of the Indians. But now, look at those crazy blue corduroys this next fellow's wearing here. And what's your name? Joe Levine. Joel Levine? And how old are you, Joe? Seven and a half. And I suppose you'd rather be some other age, too. Most kids do. Yeah. What? Three. Why would you rather be three? I don't have to go to school. <laughs> What's your favorite subject in school? Handball. Handball, huh? <laughs> Would you make any changes in school if you could? Yeah, I, did, I, I would make them give me some uh, soda pop every second. <laughs> You'd be a busy little bee with that soda pop, wouldn't you? Mm. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be an ice cream man. You well, know, I think it's pretty obvious why. Why do you want to be an ice cream man? Because I can, so I won't give no ice cream to nobody. I'll eat it for myself. <laughs> You're a starving boy, huh? Do you ever dream about anything? Yeah. What do you dream about? One in the movies. What do you do? What do you dream about when you're in the movies? Porky Pig. <laughs> you mean you dream you're a friend of Porky Pigs? Yeah, I'm a friend of Porky Pig. I'm a Porky Pig fan. <laughs> if you were real hungry in the jungle somewhere, you wouldn't eat Porky Pig, would you? No, I wouldn't. Why not? He's not kosher, and I wouldn't eat one. <laughs> that either. He said he didn't want to eat his friend either. <laughs> Tell me, young lady, what's your name? Geraldine Gollum. <laughs> All right, I agree. What's your name, little girl? Barbara Louise Cass. And how old are you, Barbara? Six and three quarters. Oh, my goodness. Six and three quarters. You have it right down to a nickel. Teacher tells me that on the way here in the big limousine, you're talking about operations. Now, you're too young a girl to have operations. That's what old ladies talk about. Is that right? How many have you had? I don't know how many I have had. Well, what are some of them, for instance? Line my tonsils out, my anoids out, I was circumcised, I had a mole burned off in one week. <laughs> Your daddy's a what? Engineer. An engineer. And um, um, what does your mother do? Well. <laughs> okay, then. You've lived richly. There's no doubt about that. Uh, what are you? What are you going to be when you grow up? A singer. Are your parents here in the audience today? One of them. One of them. Just wondered who that was that went up through the ceiling. <laughs> They're probably in Glendale by now. <laughs> Hello, young fella. Uh, I don't see anything very funny, do you? No. No. Ben, you're a country boy, they tell me. Yes. I understand that just a couple of minutes ago before you came on stage, they offered you some of our pasteurized milk here, and you didn't like that city milk. No. You wouldn't drink it. Why not? Because I'm used to our own cow's milk. Oh, you will drink it right from the cow or not at all? Yes. You don't want any middlemen in there. <laughs> well, do you do any of the cow milking yourself? Yes, my mother was teaching me a long time ago. Well, what's the main thing to remember in learning how to milk a cow? Well, not to pull the tits down too far. <laughs> You're going to 
call her Draggy from now on. What's your name, little girl? I'll get on to it. You are listening to Same Time, Same Station. And this episode of our continuing chronicle of radio's first half century is devoted to original recordings of radio bloopers. I see that it's time to pause for station identification. This is the, the Mutual Don Lee broadcast. <laughs> this is WCBM AM and FS. No. This is KRLA Pasadena. Not only kids gave funny answers to adult questions. Remember a program called 20 Questions with the offstage voice giving the radio audience advance answers? Now an interesting subject sent by Patricia Everett of Spokane, Washington. We're sending her a Ronson lighter. This subject is animal. The panel can't hear me telling you that our subject this time is the father expecting the stork. All right. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this animal in 20 questions. Van de Venner? I'm glad the audience is having a lot of fun because I can't laugh. We're all going to They have must have all fun. come up on the same train. What's the first question, Van? Is this a living American man? <laughs> Miss Renard? Is it Van de Venner? <laughs> Living or dead? Oh, he's alive. This man's alive, Van. Uh, is he in the government? Well, some of them are, and some of them are. Oh, it's one of those. Yeah. Okay. It's a certain kind of living American man. He doesn't necessarily have to be American either. I want to be helpful on this. Van? Uh, this is a class question, and that's a statement. Uh, well, thank you for the statement. <laughs> Bobby? Uh, is this a uh, man denoted by his occupation? physical appearance. Can he be... What was your question? Can he be detected by his physical appearance? <laughs> yes, he usually can. Yeah. Benny? Is it a natural phenomenon? <laughs> of nature, Benny. <laughs> Herbert? Does he wear a uniform? <laughs> some of them do and some of them don't. That's eight questions. Van de Venner? Does this, uh, can this man be identified by any act that he has committed? <laughs> have used this question. <laughs> All right, that's nine questions. Herbert? Does he ever take a bath? <laughs> <laughs> but he probably wouldn't remember it. He wouldn't. Van? Remember. Is this a legal act? <laughs> Van? Van 
needs explanation. I don't mean is he a criminal, but uh, as, for instance, a uh, bridegroom would be committing a legal act when he got married. Yes. Oh, yes, it's perfectly legal. That's 11 questions. Miss Renard? Well, is it a desirable act? I should say so. Highly. All right, 12 questions you've used, Van. Is the act committed in association with anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Van? Is the someone else a woman? Yes. Van? Well, is it a bridegroom? Uh, bridegroom? No. No. How many questions is that? That's 15 mm. questions. You've got five to go. Van is Does definitely. it have anything to do with marriage? Yes. Sure. All right, that's got four questions to go. Herbert? Is it the justice of the peace? <laughs> well, some of them are, and some of them aren't. Miss Renard? Is it a new father, the heritage? That's right. That's right. It's a father, it's a father expecting the stork, and you got it in 18 questions, and my hat is off to you. That was really a hard one to get. Politicians, a fertile field for verbal fluffs. First, see if you agree with this man's stand on the withholding tax issue. Then grimace with the late Adlai Stevenson. I believe that the advantages, uh, as opposed to the disadvantages, uh, as regards to the withholding tax, uh, there's no comparison. I believe that we should be against the withholding tax. I am for it, and I will do what I can to uh, uh, function as an uh, advocate of this philosophy. Here is a message from Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. Protest demonstrations have taken place by workers whose trade union rights have been betrayed, by Catholics whose freedom of expression has been circumcised. Circumscribed. By professional men. <laughs> well, I believe it at least is a Christian right. Senator Estes Kefauver, hero of the Senate crime investigations of the 50s, receives an award. Actress Jinx Falkenberg pays him tribute. An inside note. Remember that Rudolph Halley was counsel for the Senate Crime Investigating Committee. I know that I was asked to accept this award for Senator Kefauver as a housewife, because I think that that's what Senator Kefauver did more than anything else in bringing the Senate Crime Investigating Committee into the home, into the kitchen, and giving us all an idea of what was happening right here in New York City. And I know that luckily I was sick the first day of the hearings, so I spent uh, three days in bed enjoying Rudy Halley. <laughs> and I must say, I, I got to know his every move so very well. <laughs> no. Wait, wait a minute. But no, what I meant to say is that I missed... <laughs> I really... You know what I mean. Just as children can startle their interviewers on the air, so can their elders on panel discussion programs. Meet the press. That stalwart standard of Sunday opinion was not immune. In a uh, reply, uh, Mr. Minister, a few moments ago to another question, you said that the Jews enjoy... Uh, liberties in the Soviet Union. Uh, would you permit Yiddish theaters to exist, the press to exist, literature to exist, uh, if you, uh, well, would you permit that to exist, sir? In my country, all peoples enjoy freedom from the development of culture, and that includes the Jews. I have many friends who are Jews. Many of our well, most prominent leaders, in fact, have married uh, Jewish girls, and they're, they're, they have excellent relations. I would say uh, that uh, let others have relations that are as good. And remote broadcasts offered multitudinous chances for glory and great mistakes. 
For here, the remote and the studio crews often operate blind with only a set of standard cues which act as verbal triggers for human action. Let the wrong word slip or a tense ear believe to hear, and we could suddenly have a new national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, the vocalist and organist is Gladys Gooding, and now our national anthem. Who look sharp and take time and go to feel sharp. On the ball, hey, hey! Just be sharp. Use the let get help to those easy shapes. Young man, feel safe. What does New Year's Eve mean to you? Perhaps an uninhibited party with John Barleycorn in attendance. But if you're a network news announcer, New Year's Eve can be deadly dull, especially if there's a party going on just outside the studios. It's an hour between newscasts, and one or two short ones can't hurt, right? So you venture forth. The minutes tick by, and goodness me, almost time for the hourly news. Back to the booth, just in time to say... The Russiest attempting to avenge the death of Michael Max seemed to have scored a big hit. NBC Radio, News on the Hour. Now here is... The news in brief, arsonists attempting eventually to uh, uh, avenge the assassination of Negro, Estem uh, Negro Estem extremist Malcolm X hit headquarters, or Muslim headquarters, at the opposite ends of the country today. The Harlem headquarters were destroyed, as was a mosque in San Francisco on the West Coast. When a newsman goofs, it may not be news, but it is often very funny. Perhaps we expect our newscasters to be just a bit superhuman in their vocal delivery as they bring us the facts of today's world. Our program of bloopers now looks at the news, again through the recordings that we believe to be original, true, and accurate. And now, back to the news. Hey, Mr. Stevens. One of America's best-known political and diplomatic figures, John Wynant, died tonight by his own hand at his home in Concord, New Hampshire. Dr. Clarence Butterfield said that the 58-year-old former governor of New Hampshire and the former ambassador to Britain committed suicide by shooting himself in the head with a large 60-cent-sized package of Alka-Seltzer. Let's take a look at the Kentucky Derby, where the steadily improving Tim Tam and the sensational stretch-running Silky Sullivan were quoted as co-favorites at 2-5 to five today, as the second-richest Kentucky Derby in history loomed with 19 finally tuned three uh, you know, fellow listed as probable starters. The ladies and gentlemen of the arrangements committee are fervently hopeful that there will be no repetition of the untoward incidents which marred some of the earlier day inauguration jamborees. Even with four balls, a space is a big. <laughs> <laughs> Here is Herb Kaplow, NBC News. Now, if you'd call me at 2 p.m., what did you want back then? Herb uh, Kaplow? Stay on the way, hurry up. I figured this was it. That's what I was waiting for. Yeah, but they have already introduced me. Okay. Federal Mediation Director Joseph Finnegan announced this afternoon he'll summon Steel Union and management officials to a series of mediation conferences starting next week, probably Tuesday. Dispatches from Prague this morning report that the Communist Premier of Czechoslovakia, Clement Gottwald, told a meeting called last night to form a Communist Action Committee that a quick communist victory was certain now, and he's quoted as saying it may be in several hours, but it will certainly be in several days. Well, there can be no doubt since the communists already control the Czech police and are beginning to go through that, uh, this, uh, going, and are beginning to go through this control uh, to, I'm sorry. Christian Herter of the United States 
Andrei Gromyko of the Soviet Union, Selwyn Lloyd of Britain, and Maurice Kabid, Kabu de Murville of France. You have the pleasure of feeling good because you've done something good. You'll go to bed happy tonight because you'll know that some child, a child who almost always goes to bed hungry, will be fell, wed fell, well fed very soon. You know the den mothers of scub cow... <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, this is true. At uh, harness tracks, they prevent the appearance of so-called ringers by uh, checking the, the, the uh, chestnuts of the entrance. Chestnuts are the slatish gray wart-like formations on the insides of the knees on all four legs of a horse. Now, they're never the same on any two animals. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson Fox, the Chicago White Sox fiery little second basin. Of course, the story is well known now. Oklahoma wanted a... Uh, to get uh, McClellan into the... Uh, Oklahoma wanted to get McClellan in there, of course, as a football star. Baylor asked that uh, they write a letter saying that uh, they had not tampered with the uh, athlete McClellan. <laughs> the electronic experiments in the Danger Islands will observe ionizing sources on the sun. And the resultant ion ionization oh, wrapped itself around the fire nose hosel. The aphid feeding Bailey's foliage will, in turn, provide plenty of food for the ladybugs. And Bailey figures it won't be long before he will have aphidless less anchorage. Shh. Won't be long. Shh. And Bailey figures it won't be too long before he will have aphid little less anchorage. After singles by Kaline and Gail Harris and the walk loaded the bases in the sixth, Ron scored when Ford fumbled Larry Rollers and rolling in food a sacrifice fly to Mickey Mantle. Thanks to Thomas Patton, president of Republic Steel Corporation, who's spokesman for the 12 steel, uh, steel companies now negotiating, and the members of the panel for stimulating an enlightening half hour. Well, one of the new products on display recently, recently at the Atom Fair in Cleveland. Uh, let's start all over again. Imagine the hatch of a great rocket ship, rocket ship swings open. A man steps out. Name any American-made automobile, and the chances are good that it's an ancestor of a snazzy, distinctive convertible coupe put together by an 18-year-old Virginia youth. Push buttons, raise and lower windows, open doors, uncap the gas tank, operate signal lights, and also blow two horns. Slick has a 1950 model horn for ordinary purposes, but for a laugh or a lifted eyebrow, he has a squawking 1926-type horde, hood, horn under the hood. <laughs> Scientists say a successful orbit of the moon is unlikely in this pioneering attempt. This is Frank, <coughs> pardon me, Frank Blair, NBC News. <coughs> what does super anahist cough syrup do for you that no other type syrup can do? In the windy city of Chicago... <whistles> the president did later pose for pictures with Iowa Republican candidates but did not plug them publicly. It will see an educational system, said Hutchins, that delivers less education per dollar than almost any other saying that all it needs is more money. <laughs> no comma in there. In British Columbia, actor Errol Flynn died at Vancouver Hospital tonight after being brought there by an emergency squad. Flynn fit to perfection the popular concept of a movie star until the last few years when he grew punchy. Rather punchy. The president has more or less confined himself to statements that it is... to statements that it is his... The doctor told of a case of a buck-toothed boy who wore his bad teeth like a chip on his shoulder. 
His friends kidded him, and he couldn't take it. Soon he was a full-blown delinquent. A social worker sent him to... <laughs> Stop the clock! Three U.S. airmen were killed when a B-47 jet bomber crashed into the Santa Rita Mountains near Tucson, Arizona. The big plane crashed into a bridge high up in the mountains. It disintegrated into a, bar, a, fire of ball, a ball of fire. There were no... Sur there were no survivors. Please excuse me. And down in Delaware, in the senatorial race, uh, uh, Williams, uh, the Republican, is leading uh, Democrat um, Carvel uh, by about uh, 1,000 uh, votes. Uh, and where did we go from there? <laughs> A program for air photographic mapping of 400,000 square kilometers in central Brazil. Winston Churchill has celebrated his 84th birthday. He ate a 30-pound birthday cake along with his children and his grandchildren. And finally, the network commentators and their erudite announcers. Why does a network seat the two at a single table in the same studio, facing each other to wait for that inevitable flub that will, human nature being what it is, bring a chuckle to the lips and finally a tear to the eye? In order, you will hear Julian Anthony, Pauline Frederick and her announcer, Paul Harvey and his announcer, then Lowell Thomas. We obtained portions of these mirthful minutes from different sources. Twice you will hear sudden changes in audio quality as we spliced two sections of the same broadcast together. That makes these examples no less genuine. They are the originals, just as broadcast. In the wonder world of science, uranium has been discovered a few hundred yards from the White House and nearly 300 feet up. It's in the granite of the Washington Monument, but not valuable or dangerous. Back here in New York, the Hayden Planetarium is heard from a Minnesota man who claims that the shape of Aurora Borealis, the northern lights, can be changed by flapping a bedsheet at them from the ground. The planetarium doubts it, but the man says he did successfully flap sheets in his backyard one midnight, though his wife kept hollering at him to cut out the foolishness and get back in the house. Now, now here are today's closing Dow Jones stock averages. Industrials off, 14 cents. Rails up. Three cents, utilities up to seven cents. And that's today's headline edition. Tune in tomorrow at this same time for headline edition. You'll hear important reports of the names who made the news and vivid on <laughs> This Sunday evening, be sure and hear Drew Pearson on ABC. Pearson has received many awards for his work, and one of his treasures is the Saturday Review of Literature site. <laughs> This is ABC. As for the intentions of Governor Stevenson, the governor announced in Springfield, Illinois, that he's a candidate for governor and nothing else. As the president said yesterday, politics as a game beats football, baseball, basketball, and any other sport. And now I'm off to Providence, Rhode Island, to participate in a forum on that highly debatable subject, Are We Winning Friends for America Abroad? And so until this time, Monday, this is Pauline Frederick, hoping that your weekend, too, will be a very stimulating one. Lone Journey, heard every weekday morning on ABC, unveils the heartbreak of three lonely people. It's a lone journey for Sidney McKenzie because she's married to Lansing and in love with Wolf. Will Sidney regret her decision to stick by her husband at all costs? She and Lansing have been marooned in Wolf's ranch house by a raging snowstorm. Sydney has pneumonia, Lansing a broken arm. Both need care, care that Wolf is willing to give, but which Lansing resents because of his seething jealousy of the man who was once married to his wife. But Lansing's jealousy has jumped the bounds of common sense. He struck Wolf in an unreasonable rage. He tried to burn the penicillin intended for Sydney because Wolf was going to administer it. In striking out at Wolf, will Lansing destroy what he's trying so desperately to keep Sidney's love? Hear Lone Journey over ABC today. Pauline Frederick is heard Monday at this time. This program came from New York. This is the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>
Sharp reports on the lady who was shopping for a frilly nightgown as a birthday present for her pet poodle. They didn't have any, but the store clerk said, if you'll measure the dog, we'll have one made. And the lady said, oh, I couldn't do that. I want it to be a surprise. Page two. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, <laughs> one of the most spectacular kinds of automobile accidents <laughs> is the one in which a car not only gets banged up, <laughs> but bursts into flames. What makes it really horrible is the idea that a driver and his passenger, stunned by the accident, may be trapped inside the burning car. The National Safety Council says that, fortunately for most of us, this type of spectacular smash-up is very rare. <laughs> Only one dra- <laughs> Good night, Mother. <laughs> uh, the thing that stuns people inside a car... <laughs> well, some days just... Doesn't make it get up. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Time now, once again, for Paul Harvey News. <laughs> And what more can I say than Paul Harvey? Good day. The chief personality was our minister to Luxembourg, Mrs. Pearl Mesta, who, of course, is the nation's number one party giver and certainly knows how to run off an affair in smooth style. But this time, everything went haywire. The ceremony was the American Legion presentation of a flag of Luxembourg for Madame Mesta to take back with her. But Herbert Jacoby, National Vice Commander of the American Legion, was 30 minutes late. He had to appear in court. So Mrs. Mesta left. And when the Vice Commander did arrive, she kept him waiting for 15 minutes. Oh, just had to fix my hair, she explained. Then the banner was unpacked, and Mrs. Mesta cried, That isn't the flag of Luxembourg. That's the flag of Schleswig und and so on. Said Commander Jacoby, It must be, because the American Legion could not be wrong. To break the deadlock, an official from the Luxembourg legation was summoned, and he said the disputed flag was okay. Madam Minister Pearl Mesta was just a bit mixed up. So the ceremony started all over again, only to be halted. This time, the film and the newsreel camera got tangled. Then the newsreel sound recording went out of gear. <laughs> uh, finally, this speech <laughs> I got going. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, the vice commander started out. He said, Madam President. No, grown an official from the State Department. You mean Madam Minister. The blunder was corrected, and Mrs. Mester responded by saying that she'd deliver the flag to what she called our defense minister and prime minister. That drew another cry of anguish from the State Department. Not proper for an American diplomat to call a foreign official our defense minister. She tried it again, and this time said, the defense minister, who is also our prime minister. Once again, that fatal pronoun, our, and the echo was ouch. At long length, the ceremony was completed correctly. The flag of Luxembourg is on its way. And long may it wave. And the little girl deserves to know her mother. So says Alice, and I think her mother deserves to know her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alice, Alice also was thinking of her husband. <laughs> Phil Harris, the band leader. <laughs> she explains that working so hard all day in the film studio, she is sometimes not in such perfectly good humor. <laughs> and she, she snaps at hubby. <laughs> Which is all wrong. <laughs> Which I say, hell all for us. <laughs> I'll leave the rest of it to you. <laughs> Lowell, tomorrow is the first of May. <laughs> <laughs> that means that summertime is rushing toward us. And when hot weather gets here, it puts an added responsibility on the oil that's in your motor. For then, the oil must do three things. It must help keep your motor clean, must keep it well lubricated, and must help carry off excess heat. 
And for years, Sunoco Oil has been doing all three of these things. Now Lowell Thomas says, So long until tomorrow. <laughs> this program came to you from New York. And now, Lowell, have you a few more unforgettable words? About a new book called Diet or Die. Author, Mrs. Celeste Geyer, perhaps better known to millions of carnival fans as the one-time Dolly Dimples. Remember, the world's most beautiful fat lady? That was the billing Mrs. Geyer used when she weighed 555 pounds. Count them, 555 pounds. Now a svelte 122. She tells in her book how she did it, following the advice of a doctor who told her after a near fart, uh, fatal uh, heart attack to diet or die. The secret of effective weight loss, massive willpower, says Mrs. Geyer, adding that her own willpower was strengthened by the memory. <laughs> well, anyhow, she said that her uh, fat friends from Carnival Life died at an early age, later buried from the back of a truck, those her own words. Why truck? Because in Mrs. Geyer, they were too big for a hearse. Oh, gosh. And so long until Monday, Lowell. This is Warren Moran now reminding you to listen each evening, Monday through Friday at this same time, for the distinctive news reports of Lowell Thomas. Listen again Monday evening for Lowell Thomas and the News. <laughs> I feel you near Once more you're my love Of yesteryear Be with us next week for another nostalgic look at Radio of Yesteryear Now it's just about time we were picking up our memories and moving along our way. I hope you've enjoyed listening to these songs and the memories that go with them as much as I've enjoyed bringing them to you. Same Time, Same Station is produced for KRLA News and Public Affairs by John Price. Associate Producer, Cam Courier. Special Research by Martin Halperin, Leo McElroy, and many other collectors of radio bloopers. If you, as a broadcaster, found your on-air bloopers a part of this program, Remember that to err is human, to forgive divine. So please forgive us for laughing with you. Next week, a tribute to a very special radio station, the only American one to ever have a superpower transmitter and a reputation to match. Tune in next Sunday for our tribute to The Nation Station, WLW Cincinnati. I know you won't want to miss it, so be sure to be with us next week at this same time same station.